Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm privileged to be talking with Donna Soff. Donna is a PhD in invertebrate biology from Stanford University, and she has been studying cephalopods for many years. Her writing on marine life has appeared in Science, the Journal of Experimental Biology, Aquaculture, and many other publications. And she is the author of the book, Monarchs of the Sea, the Extraordinary 500 Million Year History of Cephalopods. And that's what we talk about in this conversation. We begin by talking about her reasoning for writing the book and passion for her research. We talk about the taxonomy and anatomical features of cephalopods. We talk about how we understand cephalopods from the fossil record, the genesis of them, and the first common ancestor of cephalopods. We talk about the three main categories, aminoids, coleoids, and nautiloids. We talk about the importance of aminoids, and we also talk about the importance of shells for ancient cephalopods and how they've now become internalized. We talk about the distinctive uh, features of coleoids. Uh, we talk about the fascinating and mysterious uh, aspects of the enduring nautilus, which has pretty much gone unchanged for hundreds of millions of years. And then we talk about current day cephalopods and kind of their future. Um, I've said plenty of times on the podcast that I'm a really big fan of cephalopods and the octopus and cuttlefish and squid. And I was so happy to get Donna on the podcast. She's um, such a joy to talk to and she's you know, brilliant on this stuff. And it was great to really just get the history of these you know, mysterious and fascinating creatures. And so I love this conversation and I, I hope everyone out there that's listening enjoys it as well. So now I bring you Donna Stoff. I'm here with Donna Stoff. Donna, how's it going? It's going pretty well. Thank you. Oh, um, thanks so much for coming on the on the podcast. I read your book and I loved it and I'm super excited to talk to you about it. It is uh, Monarchs of the Sea, the extraordinary 500 million year history of cephalopods. So tell us uh, why you decided to write a book on the history of cephalopods and just tell us, uh, you know, who you are and what you do and all that wonderful stuff. So I have been a cephalopod nut since early childhood when I fell in love with octopuses at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and went home, um, pestered my parents until they helped me figure out how to keep a pet octopus. Uh, it's much smaller than the one that I had seen at the aquarium, but um, but still very exciting. And I became the girl with the pet octopus at school. And I ended up going on to, uh, to do a PhD in cephalopod biology. I worked on squid instead of octopuses. Um, I had broadened my my affections somewhat. And, um, and then by the time I finished graduate school and I had done this, uh, my doctoral dissertation on the reproduction of, and the early life history. So like the babies of this really cool species of squid, Humboldt squid, I had gotten really, I felt like I knew a lot about cephalopods generally about octopuses, squid, cuttlefish. The, I mean, there's a lot that we still don't know, but I felt kind of up to speed with the literature on their behavior and their, what we know about their activities. And when the opportunity came for me to write a book, I realized that the thing that I, about cephalopods that I still didn't know very much about was kind of where they came from, mm. sort of their deep evolutionary history. And it was something that was really interesting to me in large part because while I was working on squid, I was hearing them described, reading them being described in the literature as the invertebrate fish. Mm. It's kind of a shorthand um, that people sometimes use that they're like the, the snail's way of making a fish mm. or, uh, and, and I thought like, well, there's a, whole evolutionary story of how cephalopods, squid and octopuses have been evolving alongside vertebrates, us, fish and all of our relatives. And, and I wanted to get into it. It was something I didn't know much about. And so it was a really cool opportunity for me to call up a bunch of paleontologists, people who had been working in this field, digging up fossils and say, okay, tell me what you know, what, what's out there. And it was like, I mean, it was kind of like falling in love all over again, meeting all of the the history. Yeah, no, that's that's wonderful. And and I got to say, the, you know, writing um, 
history of the planet or different stages i mean 500 million years is a long ass time um it's not four billion years but goodness it's it's a long time it's a long time to cover it's a lot of periods to cover um and you you do it super well um i remember uh uh, recently i just uh talked to henry g and um he just wrote a book uh called uh, a very short history of uh, life on earth and he's basically like a history of the planet <laughs> i was like uh you know four point whatever billion years and and what does he say he gives us an additional you know billion to just see where it all ends um and you know he talks about where it's like the the shift from water to land that's such a hard period in our history we don't really know all of the answers of how that happened we don't have all of the um, fossils for the intermediary species on and on and on and on so it's a cephalopods are are um definitely around to that part of our history as well and so it's just interesting how they the the shelled component and then the chambers and then how they get to where how we know them today so it'll be fun to to get into all of that so i I guess the first uh question i have about uh cephalopods is taxonomy now for some people this might sound super boring or whatever but um i think it's actually super important uh taxonomy questions are important for a lot of different things and i definitely think they are for uh cephalopods so cephalopods are the group yeah and so we have nautiloids coleoids and aminoids right so what is the the current um taxonomy for cephalopods and what is our historic taxonomy and what are some of the differences um therein are because it was something that I had to wrestle with early on in mm. writing the book is how am I going to talk about the different groups of cephalopods mm-hmm. because if you don't this kind of what taxonomy is is that at first glance it maybe it doesn't seem as exciting as behavior what the animals mm-hmm. are doing mm-hmm. but if you don't have the if you don't agree on the words for what you're talking about you don't know if you're talking about the same things and so that was why um even though the the terms are a little bit obscure, I settled on using these three terms, aminoid, coleoid, and nautiloid, because cephalopods really did go in three very distinct directions early on. And the and the names themselves, I'm kind of a linguistic nerd as well. Mm. And so I often like to dig in and find out what the words mean in their Greek roots or their Latin roots or whatever, wherever they come from. And that often helps me remember them. And so what I really like is that the name coleoid, which covers almost all of the cephalopods that anyone would see or think about today, it actually means sheath. It comes from the the old word for the sheath of a sword. And the reason they're all called that is that they have a shell inside their body, like a sword inside a sheath. And so what you see on the outside of an octopus or a squid or a cuttlefish is their skin, their flesh. Um, And so in a way, they're like us. They have an internal skeleton. We have our bones inside of our body and they have their shell inside their body. And so that is that group, the coleoids, the sheath cephalopods, like I said, they're all, that's all the octopus, squid, cuttlefish, uh, kind of everything in between the vampire squid, the everybody. And, you know, people don't think of a lot of those as having shells at all. An octopus especially is very squishy, right. but it's because that shell has been reduced over time. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that more, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but even the, the squishiest octopuses, a lot of them do have little tiny rods that are like these vestigial shells mm. from when they used to have bigger ones. And then the other two groups, the aminoids and the coli, uh, sorry, the aminoids and the nautiloids, they both had, had, and have those who are still around external shells. So they're a soft body stuffed into a shell like a snail Mm -hmm. Um, and their shell is coiled like a snail and the way that it's coiled and the way that it grows is different between the aminoids and the nautiloids but superficially they look fairly similar because most of them are coiled shells with an animal stuffed inside Mm -hmm. and the nautiloids are the ones that we still have today the yeah. pearly nautilus or the chambered nautilus. Those are the beautiful coiled seashells that people may have seen in museums. Um, they are, unfortunately, I would say, still fairly easy to purchase for a private collection. And really? I say unfortunately because they uh, they are now listed as endangered. That wow. happened just a couple of years ago that they would receive protection both internationally with CITES and in the U.S. with the Endangered Species Act. And so people are working now 
now on protecting those animals because they were over harvested for the mm. beautiful shells. Wow. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Uh, and so the other, so the nautiloids are the coiled externally shelled ones that we still have. Mm -hmm. And then the aminoids are gone. They went extinct with the dinosaurs, mm -hmm. but they have amazing fossils. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's an interesting uh, group. The, those uh, uh, those cousins are are, are interesting. Um, but the, the I have to say, reading the book, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the the octopus. I, I love them. They're one of my favorite you know, sea creatures um, for various reasons. I think they're just a, a marvel of a, of, a, of an animal. But um, I really had a, a newfound wonder and uh, of this mysterious uh, Nautilus. Uh, the fact, I and mean, we'll get into it, but the fact that it's really not that much different and hasn't really changed that much, at least not relative to uh, coleoids and, and then how we have um, cephalopods today, from 500 million years ago, it just blows my mind. Like you could almost do just like a straight line from like their common ancestor to how they are today. And no one really knows why and how they started. Like it's just that I did not know that. And it was, uh, it was absolutely kind of like, you know, mind blowing when I read that. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. So, um, so what about the, the, his, what can we say about the historic, uh, anatomy of cephalopods? So we have the kind of groupings. Um, oh, sorry, before I get to that. So what's the current taxonomy for cephalopods? So what do we have today? So that's the kind of historic lineage. So today we have the octopus and we have cuttlefish and the nautilus is still around. Um, we have squid. What are the, the taxonomy that we have currently today that we have on the, on the planet? Let's we'll start by settling setting the Nautilus aside because they're in that big group Nautiloids mm -hmm. and they're the only ones. There is several species of them fairly closely related with the big, beautiful external shells mm -hmm. and an animal stuffed inside. And the animal stuffed inside looks very different from a squid and octopus when you look at it closely. It has um, anywhere from 60 to 90 or more tentacles. The wow. tentacles do not have suction cups on them. Uh, their eyes are very different. They Their vision is not nearly as good and they rely a lot on chemosensory, which is basically smelling and tasting the water around them. Mm -hmm. So that's all the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then all the others are coleoids. And the way those break down um, are primarily into two groups, the, the octopodiforms and the decapodiforms. And again, going back to the roots, the, the octopodiforms are with the eight arms mm -hmm. for oct, the decapodiforms are with 10 appendages. This, that's, so that's going to be your squid and cuttlefish. Mm -hmm. And squid and cuttlefish have 10 appendages. I'm using that word mm -hmm. carefully mm -hmm. because... The, of those 10 appendages, eight are what we call arms. They're very similar to octopus arms. They have suckers all along their length. They're flexible, they can move, they can grab. And then the other remaining two that a squid or a cuttlefish has are tentacles. They are elastic. They only have suction cups on the end. It almost is like the hand on the end of an arm that has suction cups on it. And so when you see a squid or a cuttlefish hunting, they'll often shoot out those two tentacles very fast. It's called a tentacular strike and it is super, super fast to catch their prey and then use those eight arms to hold it while they're manipulating it and eating it. Hmm. And so those are the two big groups then you see of your, your octopuses over here, your squid and cuttlefish over here. But of course, there's always gotta be some little outliners. So you get your vampire squid, yeah, yeah. which do have 10 appendages. They have eight arms, but instead of two elastic tentacles like squid and cuttlefish, they have two filaments that are super thin hmm. and they just sort of unspool like thread and vampire squid use them to catch detritus, like basically sea trash, but not trash like plastic, trash like little bits of dead animals and little bits of poop and all of the stuff that they digest. And so research has actually shown that vampire squid, despite the name, are more closely related to octopuses. Hmm. They're actually in the same group as the eight-armed octopuses. Um, and then you also have a couple of other outliers. You have these squid called ram's horn squid, spirula, mm. that mm -hmm. have an internal coiled shell. It's the only remaining cephalopod with that. And they're kind of off on their own as well. Yeah, there, it's interesting how, you know, once you understand the history of where all of uh, 
the cephalopods come from and then how they are, you know, they shake out today. It's, it's interesting when you follow that history, because there's a big part in the book where you talk about the aminoids and like they had a big part of uh, that history and now they're just gone. They don't exist. But then you have someone like uh, the, the Nautilus, which is, you know, still hanging around. So it's just very interesting how um, as the planet changed uh, and the environment changed, the evolution of this group of, uh, of animals uh, is, is uh, continuously evolving over time. So it's, it's very fascinating. Okay. So the anatomy, so you were kind of getting into that anyway. So you were talking about how they have the appendages and then some have, you know, eight and then some have the, you know, eight plus two. What are the other things we can say about the historic anatomy of the cephalopods? So many of them having shells initially, and now they don't, or it's internalized. And then their current anatomy, such as, as you already mentioned, the number of tentacles, um, shells, ones that have shells, ones that don't, or they've been internalized, the, the jet propulsion, etc. So a little bit more about the anatomy. Yeah, that's great. So the really frustrating thing, I mean, it's, it's almost humorous at that point, is we do not have clear soft body fossils of most cephalopods. Mm -hmm. So aminoids, especially, and nautiloids that lived inside these substantial shells, we cannot say for sure how many arms they had. And it's such a basic question and it's so <laughs> frustrating. So even though new fossils are being discovered and even within the last year, a new soft body fossil of an aminoid was discovered. And the, the theory is that it was, usually we think the reason we don't find soft, the soft parts is that they're, uh, they get eaten. You know, the sh the, either the animal is caught and preyed upon and eaten, and then the shell is all that's preserved, or even if it dies of some of a disease, of senescence, of something else, it would fall to the seafloor and microbes and scavengers would eat the soft parts. Mm. And so we end up with just the shells preserved. But there was this, this case just in the last year of a soft, the soft body of an aminoid preserved in fossil form. And, to, and it was thought that it had maybe been pulled out of its shell by a predator, but then the predator didn't eat it all and it fell to the seafloor and was somehow buried quickly enough to be preserved. And the paleontologists were able to look at internal organs and, um, and the attachment sites of muscles to the shell. And there were no arms. Hmm. They had all been eaten. So it was, just, it was almost comical. Like the, the most, the biggest question that I think most of us have is how many arms did they have and what did they look like? And it's still so difficult to answer. Um, but one of the really cool things that paleontologists can do is make very good extrapolations based on what we know about other things. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, we have really good evidence that it's an ancestral state, meaning it's something that goes way, way back in the cephalopod lineage to have 10 equal arms, because we see that even in the development of a nautilus, when you look at a baby nautilus growing in the egg, it starts off with 10 equal arm buds. And it's only later in development that those divide into having the many arms. And so the current best hypothesis is that the aminoids and the early nautiloids before the ones that we see today probably all had 10 equal arms. Hmm. And then over time, the ancestors of the coleoids, uh, one pair of those arms became specialized. In the case of squid and cuttlefish, one pair of the arms became specialized to be hmm. the tentacles. In the case of the vampire squid and the octopuses, one pair of arms, a different pair of arms actually, because you can track them through development, a different pair of arms became specialized to become the filaments in vampire squid and to disappear in octopuses. So hmm. octopuses evolved from ancestors that had 10 arms. Mm -hmm. And so that's why that's our best guess is that if, you, if we don't have any reason to believe anything else, we would think that a fossil cephalopod probably had 10 equal arms. Mm. And, they, and they would have had a funnel for jet propulsion, which is something that all cephalopods have today. And so again, we can kind of extrapolate because we still have nautiluses and we know that the ancestor of nautiluses and the ancestor of squid and octopuses goes way back. Like they separated hundreds of millions of years ago. And so if they have something in common, it's very likely that that goes back to the ancestor. So the idea of this, this siphon that the animal uses to swim by jet propulsion is probably universal to the cephalopods. And in a lot of the fossils, you can even see a notch in the fossil shell mm. where the siphon would have been. And so we can extrapolate that they're all swimming by filling up their body with water and squirting it out of that siphon and that mm. propels them in the other direction. Yeah, I, I think it's, again, interesting how there are many things that 
align them together, but then you see currently how they've over time evolved into many uh, different ways, even in terms of like the octopus is losing the two arms. Um, I guess one technical question before we get to some of the history is kind of about how we get this stuff, right? How do we understand it? Some people say like, how do you, how do you take 500 million years ago and like make any sense of that? Like, that's like, I mean, people can't even comprehend like 10,000 years ago. So, uh, just about like fossils, I was, is a, is a big, uh, component of this or other pieces too, but how do we, how do we, uh, for scientists gain information from 500 million years ago and all the way up to current day about the history of cephalopods? It's such a good question. So there's well, something that's very neat about it is that there are there's more than one way to do it. Mm-hmm. And so that's a way to kind of cross reference and test an idea. If there's an idea that has come up because of finding fossils, then sometimes that idea can be tested by looking at genetics of mm-hmm. living animals, mm-hmm. which is a neat, neat thing to, to see being possible. So the fossils themselves, we have our fossils are remains of living organisms, animals, plants, even microbes Mm -hmm. um, that have been preserved from the past. And the most common way, I think the, the way that most of us think of that happening is that a part of a body, whether it's a whole body or bones or a shell gets Uh, turned into rock. And that can happen in a number of ways. Um, A quick burial, whether it's in a volcanic eruption or burial under sediment at the seafloor in mud, in the in um, tar and the famous La Brea tar pits, for example, Mm -hmm. once it gets buried, then pressure increases on the material the organic material, which like the tissues when the bones or the skin gets slowly replaced with minerals, and you end up with a rock in the exact shape and structure and texture of the organic structure. And those can be deformed in various ways. As you can imagine, we we know that the earth moves, we have earthquakes, we have uplift and crushing. And so a lot of times fossils will be somewhat fractured, they'll be smooshed, uh, there there will be, and, and paleontologists study this stuff and how it can happen and kind of how you can reconstruct an animal from or a plant or something else from the fossil. Um, poop gets fossilized. It's called a, a trace fossil. Footprints even get fossilized. Uh, and so fossils are a huge source of information. And one of the things that was really neat that I learned while working on this book is that just, you know, we kind of think, I, at least I kind of thought of digging up fossils as a technology that hasn't changed very much. Mm. For hundreds of years, for longer, uh, thousands of years, we've been able to dig in the dirt and find fossils. Um, But actually, recent technological advances make it possible to see things in fossils that we've never been able to see before. Mm. So I was talking to researchers who've put fossil cephalopod shells through a CAT scan, basically, the same kind of scanner that uh, gets used for medical scanning to image the inside of a body of a human's body to find out what's going on. You can put fossils through those and the computed tomography, the this sort of imaging through the fossil can find things in the fossil that you wouldn't have been able to see otherwise, or you wouldn't have been able to find without destroying the fossil. Mm-hmm. And so this one research researcher, Isabel Kruta was able to look inside, uh, fossil aminoids and find their mouth parts. And by looking at the shape of their tongues that they had inside their mouth being, and, and even like little remains of food that were on them, she was able to identify that what they were feeding on, which was plankton. And so they, she concluded that these particular species were in the water hunting little bits of plankton out. So there's a lot of cool ways to look at fossils. And then on top of that, there's genetic studies, which allows you to look back in time by comparing animals like a nautilus and an octopus whose genomes divert. It means they have genes in their, in their bodies that are determining how they grow. And the differences between them have accumulated over those 500 million years or however long it was since they were last together. And so by looking at the differences and using what we know about how changes accumulate, we can make guesses about how long ago they diverged, um, how many changes have accumulated in animals that are more closely related and animals that are further apart and and also grouping them. And that was part of how 
it was recognized that vampire squid and octopuses actually shared a common ancestor much more recently mm-hmm. than vampire squid and other squid. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, yeah, that's that's great. I, I like the way you explain it. I feel like sometimes people kind of uh, skip over that part, and it's not necessarily something that needs to be belabored, but I do think it's something that is important to kind of recall and say, wait a minute, you know, for you know, a healthy amount of skepticism that people have out there. So well, how do we get all this stuff? How do we know all this? So I, I think that's, that's, that's it's wonderful. A good how you, question how you explain it. Yeah. It's just great how you explain it. I appreciate that. So, okay. So let's, let's, let's go to the Genesis, right? So we, we put, there was a time where there was, well, I don't want to say it quite this way, but there was a time where there were not cephalopods on the planet. And then there were, and not exactly in this kind of, you know, one day to the next, but, but, yes. but of sorts. Um, so in terms of common ancestor, so kind of one of the, the first, if you will, uh, how do you, um, you know, set uh, the first common ancestor for all cephalopods. You know, it was the the Adam or Eve, however you want to <laughs> describe it, right? And um, yeah. and and what makes it distinct enough in our, in its evolutionary tree to say, okay, this is a new uh, species of animal. This is, you know, I mean, obviously, there's going to be other. Uh, we're, you know, we're all connected, obviously, in the you know in the family tree of life. But what was the kind of first common ancestor for for cephalopods, and and how do we get there from the uh, kind of sponges to then shelled animals and then leading into that first common ancestor. I am so glad that you asked because <laughs> just less than a year ago, there was a new discovery. So it's not even wow. in the book. Wow. Um, wow. So, but, but to jump back to like, there was a time before cephalopods. You're absolutely right. There was the Cambrian ocean, uh, 540, 50 million years ago was it's this time of intense, evolutionary activity and the explosion what we, the cambrian yeah, explosion the cambrian explosion and it's mm-hmm. it's when the first forms of most of the kinds of animals that we know of today show up in the fossil record mm-hmm. and of course had we been around at that time it's not like we would have been sitting in the ocean actually watching things explode out of the water it still took millions and millions of years yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah. from our current perspective it we see it happening much uh, in, in a condensed period of time compared to before that period of time. And so uh, researchers have studied what is it that made that possible? Was it an increase in oxygen? Uh, was it uh, the environment itself changing? The There's still a lot of active research, but the I think one of the keys that's really interesting to think about is that life kind of bootstrapped itself. Mm-hmm. And so life had been around for ages, as you know, from, from talking about um, I'm talking to your previous interviewee. Uh, it had mostly been single cells, yeah. and then uh, multicellular organisms evolved well before the Cambrian. We mm-hmm. had sponges, we had jellies, um, but something seems to have happened where those animals started to modify their environment and burrow and dig, and uh, that we had a lot of different worm-like things really digging into the sediment. We had a lot of little shelly things uh, looking like clams, looking like snails, uh, again, sort of burrowing, digging, moving around. And that created new environments for other animals to diversify in. So once you start kind of churning up the seafloor, and this was all happening in the sea because this was long before anything was on land. Right. Uh, once they started kind of churning up the seafloor, once they started maybe moving up into the water more, then they were creating new niches uh, that predators could take advantage of, that maybe symbionts could take advantage of. So they kind of, it, it snowballed, it seems to be what happened. And so somewhere in there, some of these little shelly creatures of a group called mollusks, and a mollusks mm-hmm. is a big group. We still have mollusks. All mm-hmm. of the cephalopods are mollusks, all of the snails, all of the clams. It's a big group. Um, so some of so the mollusks showed up. And then some of them in their shells started to grow chambers, which means that they would grow a shell and the body would be in the shell. And then they would grow kind of a a layer, a wall inside the shell, sealing off part of it. Hmm. And then they would do another one. And that sealing off parts of the shell was the beginning of cephalopods. Because this this key innovation of the early cephalopods was the chambers in the shell that then slowly filled with gas mm. and actually lifted them up off the seafloor like a, like almost like a hot air balloon mm. or like an early dirigible. And they became some of the first animals that could move around in the water instead of having to crawl around on the seafloor. The first mollusks certainly that could do that. So that's what 
science, what's what paleontologists look for in fossils is chambers in the shell mm -hmm. to identify early cephalopods. And in addition to the chambers, there's also a tube that goes along the shell connecting all of the chambers. And it's the, the in that tube, this is something that we actually know from living nautiluses how it works mm -hmm. because they also have this little tube called the siphuncle and they actually can change the saltiness of the blood flowing through that tube in order to draw water out of the chambers and that lets gas diffuse in and that's how they fill their it's pretty it's, incredible it's, it's pretty incredible totally yeah. mind-blowing yeah, it's pretty incredible <laughs> i love it mm -hmm. and so the uh when i was writing the book the earliest confirmed cephalopod fossil that has these chambers and has this siphuncle is a little little friend called plectronoceros mm -hmm. uh, they were very small they would have fit in the palm of your hand and they had these uh, not fully coiled, not at all like a nautilus, but slightly curved shells mm -hmm. that had chambers in them. And they're always illustrated with their body starting to divide into tentacles, just because we know that having arms is an ancestral characteristic of cephalopods, but we don't have the fossils to prove that. So we don't really know what their soft body looks like. Um, but they definitely had chambers. They definitely could have been lifted up off of the seafloor and swum around instead of having to crawl like a snail. Mm -hmm. So that's Plectronoceros, um, mm -hmm. which is a very cute little friend. But then, and oh, and Plectronoceros is from not quite 500 million years ago, a little bit younger than that. Mm. Uh, and so that was the, the earliest ancestor that I wrote about. And of course, as I wrote, and as many other people have written, it probably was not literally the first cephalopod because right. fossils just don't happen very often. Most animals <laughs> that die get completely eaten um, or break down or whatever it is. Sure. And so you just can't expect to see fossils of everything. But in March of last year, a new paper was published of fossils that had been found in uh, Newfoundland. I'm yeah. referencing it over here because I wanted to make sure I got mm -hmm. the details right. <laughs> in Newfoundland, Canada. Um, and these fossils are from 522 million years ago. So they're about 30 million years older than Plectronoceros. Mm -hmm. And they don't have a name yet, but they do. They, this paper was published, was peer reviewed. Other scientists looked at it. Everybody seems to agree that these fossils have chambers and they have a siphuncle. And wow. so they are early, early cephalopods, even earlier than Plectomoceros, which is just really cool because it means that cephalopods go way back, mm -hmm. uh, really to much earlier in the Cambrian. Does this, does this new uh, fossil, unnamed fossil, have any connection to Plectonoceros or no? We don't really know. Um, mm -hmm. it, I think it is, I just want to make sure that I'm saying this right. Um, its shell was a little bit of a different shape. It didn't have the sort of little curve that Plectonoceros has. It's, they call it pill-shaped. It's mm -hmm. kind of a, um, it's also very small. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was divided into chambers and connected by a siphuncle. So that's that's pretty much it. I, I think that we don't have much more information about it other than that it was everybody agrees it was a cephalopod and it was pretty old. The, 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 the researchers or, or scientists that found that had to have been like, you know, struck, you know, pot of gold, just being like, oh, oh yeah. my gosh, you know, I definitely contributed something novel to science in a way that's just, you know, that's, that's so cool. That's such a cool discovery. Absolutely. It's interesting that even, I mean, that your book's not that old. So it's just like, you know, even within, you know, one, two years afterwards, you know, it's already needs to, you know, have a second edition and be updated and all this stuff. You know, it's, it's so fascinating how this stuff, uh, we keep learning new things as we move t forward in time, yes. but we also learn new things from backwards in time as well. It's just a fascinating kind of, uh, you know, parallel there between the two. It two really points is. In time. And it's definitely something that struck me while I was doing the research of, wow, how active this field is mm -hmm. and new, mm -hmm. new fossils are being discovered. New things are being discovered about old fossils by putting them through scanners and things. Mm -hmm. And then of course, there's also new genetic techniques and everything. And so actually I did the first edition of the book came out in 2017 and it was called squid empire mm. um and so monarchs of the sea which is the oh, this copy is the, that you read oh right? this is the second edition oh okay yeah it's actually already and so i it is already been revised <laughs> so you need the third and fourth edition. Right. right i know it's amazing <laughs> that's that's mm -hmm. fantastic no that's great and so and so in this time so we we, we really kind of go to like you know cephalopods really have as far as we know it currently have this kind of um uh 
home base, if you will, of saying, or this kind of grad, this class of part of that Cambrian explosion, right? They're definitely right afterwards or right yeah. during that period. Yeah. And, and, and so it's, is, is it, you know, fair to say that from roughly, you know, 500 million years ago, uh, from in the Cambrian to the Silurian, right, is one kind of epoch for cephalopods. And then at the start of the Devonian period, you see more change. So is there not a whole lot of change going on in those first couple of, you know, millions of years? And then the Devonian is where we have that really big difference in in uh, evolutionary change for cephalopods. Uh, talk, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think I think you're you're definitely pulling out something something really interesting, which is that those three groups that we talked about at the very beginning, mm -hmm. the nautiloids, the ammonoids, and the coleoids, really only differentiate there at the end of the Silurian, beginning mm -hmm. of the Devonian. Right. And so what what I kind of glossed over at the time is that there are tons of cephalopods from before those three groups even existed. Mm -hmm. And so the the Cambrian, we obviously we have this unnamed species, we have Plectronoceros, um, and then all throughout um, millions and millions of years, there are these early cephalopods with, and, and some of them got gigantic, mm -hmm. just really, really big, these straight shells mm -hmm. that, um, that would have been longer than a school bus, My just goodness. absolutely immense. So they went from these tiny little Cambrian guys mm -hmm. to in the Ordovician, the next geologic period, probably the biggest animals in the ocean, wow. like definitely the first real giants, um, everything else around, there were some pretty big crustaceans, things that looked a little bit like lobsters, but they were still smaller than a person. So really these early giant cephalopods were, were what we would have thought of as the first sea monsters, the first mm -hmm. giants. Mm -hmm. So they really were doing some cool things around then. Um, and some of them did start to curve their shells or coil them. Um, one of my favorite little stories that I wrote about in the book was of one cephalopod that seems to have tried internalizing its shell. Mm. Like there's evidence from the fossil that its body grew around its shell, kind of like that sheath I was talking about, because the shell is smoothed in a way that it only could have been by its body being around the shell. And it, and it almost, it like used that to break off the tip of its shell uh, and try to be a little bit more streamlined. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it was an experiment that doesn't seem to have worked out. There weren't any, any descendants from that that we know of. So it was, it was kind of an era of the cephalopods being very abundant, very prolific, um, but also uh, very different and kind of starting down a lot of roads that became dead ends, hmm. as far as we can tell. Hmm. And then we have at the end of the Silurian, beginning of the Devonian, these three new branches of the nautiloids and the ammonoids and the coleoids that we'll see diversify tremendously throughout the next period of their history, really. Yeah, I guess the only reason I make that distinction is that aside from the uh, ammonoids, even though they have died off and they, they're not around or, or there's not uh, um, the, that lineage is around, they were a huge group and were around for a really long time, yes. all the way to the Cretaceous. But then um, with with the other, with the coleoids and the and obviously like the nautiloids, some version of it or with the nautilus is pretty much the same they survived they went through so from the first you know cambrian to silurian there's a bunch of branching off but then they all kind of died off and they didn't they didn't they didn't make it too far um but uh, it sounds like from from right around that uh, devonian is where they they're still uh, versions from that kind of common ancestor that are what we know today. I guess that was the kind of major distinction that seems to really, it's like, why did, why did they stick, uh, from that period as opposed to previously? And I would imagine, you know, you, you have, you know, Pangea that comes into play and Rodinia before that. And so you have all of the earth, you know, changing the, the, the oceans, and then we get to land and then all this stuff so in the atmosphere and climate. So, that's my would be my suspicion but do you have any ideas about why there was a lot of expansion they didn't live that long and died off and then at that certain point towards the devonian we still have you know versions of of that from from that period right well i guess i would point out that they did live a really long time 
We're talking like millions and millions and millions yeah, yeah. of years. Uh, I think that what changed over the ocean that was really relevant to cephalopods during that time was less of the physical environment, although you're right that that was the continents were changing, the ocean mm -hmm. was changing, climate was changing, but more of the biological environment. So the animals mm -hmm. they were sharing the ocean with mm -hmm. uh, as they started out being the, f the only giants in the sea. And then over time, our ancestors, vertebrates, evolved into fish, and those fish got really big too. Mm. And so it was really the onset of the fish, as uh, as I have seen it, that really drove a lot of the change and diversification in cephalopods, because fish, once we developed these big, heavy jaws, mm -hmm. were able to attack and crush the shells of cephalopods. And so the shell itself became less of an absolute protection. Mm. And those fish were pr competing for the same prey. Mm. The fish and the cephalopods are both predators, both going after prey. And the fish were going to be faster mm. until the cephalopods evolved some way to handle that. Because a cephalopod with a long straight shell has a lot of trouble maneuvering. It's not a very convenient thing to be swimming with. Mm. And if you're the only big predator around, it doesn't matter. But once you're competing mm. with these other fish that are, they are early armored fish that can bend and move and swim a great deal faster, then it becomes a real challenge. And so I think that's that as best we understand it now, that's a lot of what drove the then the diversification in the Devonian. The Devonian is often called the age of fish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's that was driving cephalopod evolution yeah. at the time. No, that's 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 particularly instructive. Yeah, that makes that makes a whole lot more sense of why you have certain competing waters at this or the, there's competition in the waters. And so now this is going to look a little bit different. Right. I guess what is I mean, they seem to I mean, you, you wrote about them a lot in the book, but what is the key feature or understanding, I mean, there's many things, but what are some of the key aspects of understanding aminoids, even though we have minimal traces on them, they're not around, but there was, there were so many iterations, you know, in terms of if you, if you're taking in the annals of, you know, cephalopod history, what was their contribution that was so uh, tremendous for, for much of their, their, their evolutionary history? That's a great question. I mean, and aminoids are, are fun because even though um, I talked about the sort of frustrating lack of any like enough arms to count the arms fossilized, not a lot of soft parts fossilized, their shells are super abundant. Mm -hmm. Aminoid shells are some of the most abundant fossils all around the world. Um, they are so abundant and so diverse. There are big ones and little ones and spiny ones and smooth ones and tightly coiled ones and loosely coiled ones. Mm -hmm. And just like anything you can imagine, really. They're so abundant and so diverse. The paleontologists have used them for a very long time um, as little as markers, basically, as clocks. Mm. So if you mm. dig into layers of sediment, you can identify based on, you'll find ammonites everywhere. And based on where you are and which ones you find, you know how old the rocks are. Yeah, cool. And so there they are actually just for a long time, paleontologists and geologists mostly just use them for that purpose. They had names. They knew if you see this ammonite wherever you are in the world in this rock stratum, you know how old it is. You know, it compares to these rock strata in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And it actually took paleontologists a while to get to a point where they were like, wait, these are not just convenient stamps telling us what time it is. Uh, they're actually leftovers of animals, just like dinosaur bones and just like so many other fossils. And to get really interested in what those animals would have been doing and how they would have been living. Mm -hmm. um, so so the, the interesting thing for paleontologists for a long time was just how abundant and easy to find they were and easy to identify based mm -hmm. on their shells. But then from the point of view of they were alive and what were they doing, they were they would have been a really important part of the ecosystem because there were so many of them and they were all different sizes. They would have been probably very connected in a food web. So they would have been most likely generalist predators eating whatever they could catch, probably scavenging dead things, eating small crustaceans, fish, crabs, almost certainly eating each other because all cephalopods today will happily eat each other if they can. Right. Uh, and so they would have been eating everything, kind of get gathering energy from wherever they could get it. And then also being prey to anything large enough to catch them to larger fish, to larger cephalopods, um, to the marine reptiles. Once those came along, the ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs were eating tons of aminoids. Hmm. 
Um, there is just like so much evidence of the ammonoids being devoured by all of these things. And they seem to have been able to survive all this predation in part by having a really fast life cycle and quick turnover, yeah. hmm. which is something that we'll probably talk about with squids and octopuses sure. today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. I think the, the octopus has only lived two, two and a half years usually. Is that right? A lot of them less. It depends mm -hmm. on the species, but many species are one year or less. Yeah, yeah, which is, is, is absolutely interesting to think about uh, a yeah. very, complicated creature just is here and they're gone um it's wild i guess i guess the i aspect i i want i was a few things here is is about the um the the shell so i i want to kind of go back to anatomy now that we're here kind of in this uh, mesozoic period right mm -hmm. which is you know obviously from the you know the the permian which is kind of that whole great dying and then you have the triassic and then the jurassic which is where the dinosaurs are but what is it um I, th I feel like some people listening may think about like squid cuttlefish octopus and they just think about how they are today but to my understanding as i was reading the book and in other other uh, stuff i've read is they're kind of um they're very shelled at this point in time or for some of the ammonoids it almost looks like it's like in the middle part there's like half of their body internally is outside and then the other half is shelled is at least what it looks like um so what what was the the, sh the shell is super important right it's important because they all come from mollusks and then they have all of this 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 uh evolution with having the shell and as we'll, we'll see later that the shell starts to become internalized or they lose the shell so what was this i guess during the mesozoic period for the ammonoids but then for the for the, still the you know minimally changing nautilus or whatever and then for the coleoids what was the importance for the shell was it just for protection i mean if they're getting eaten by reptilian creatures couldn't have been too protective but was it, <laughs> was, it was it just for some protection for some predators um obviously you're talking about the wide diversity so we can know which periods but what can we understand about all of that and its kind of use for um uh, for for these animals, and the last point I'll ask is the uh, Westerman's uh, morphospace, which you talk yes. about, and some of the behavioral ecology we might be able to deduce from those hypotheses. Yes, yes. Well, I have to before I forget. Um, when I talked to Kathleen Ritterbush, who named Vesterman morphospace, she corrected my pronunciation because oh, it oh, is excuse Vesterman. Me. Oh, oh, Vesterman. Excuse me. Yes. 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 <laughs> um, German biologist. And that's mm -hmm, how I was mm -hmm. pronounced. Um, but we'll get to that in a moment because I wanted to hit the salient point about these shells, which was what made them so awesome when they evolved in the Cambrian continued. Mm -hmm. And for Nautilus continues to be really key. It's buoyancy. Mm. It's the fact that these animals can control control the amount of gas in their shell to make them perfectly neutrally buoyant, which means that wherever they are underwater, they don't have to expend any energy to stay there. Mm. If they were positively buoyant, then they would be the shell would be bringing them up to the surface and they would have to fight that if they wanted to stay down. Mm. And if they were negatively buoyant, they would be sinking and they'd have to be fighting that to stay up. And the shell, by being able to control exactly the ratio of gas and liquid in the chambers, keeps them neutrally buoyant. So they don't have to expend any energy to stay at a given level in the water column. Mm. And the reason that's such a powerful thing, I mean, it's it was important for fish as well. They evolved something called a swim bladder. Mm -hmm. um, many, many fish today have a swim bladder that does a similar thing inside their body, holding a certain amount of gas so that they don't have to kind of fight to stay up or fight to stay down mm -hmm. because it takes a lot of energy to swim. Yeah. We're used to moving through air, mm -hmm. but <laughs> most of us have, have swum at least a little bit and you know how incredibly more difficult it is to go the same distance underwater and it takes a lot of energy to swim. So anything that saves that energy is really advantageous. That's why and swimmers, so the professional swimmers have to eat like 12,000 calories to right. compete in the L day to compete in the Olympics because <laughs> it's just so much expenditure of energy. It, we're using our whole entire bodies to to just try and navigate through through water. So exactly. yeah, it's, it's, it, so so they don't. So this buoyancy helps them not, you know, waste energy. Which right. for for all or for most uh, living organisms on the planet, that's really the thing. How much it's energy huge. are we putting out and putting in and all that stuff? So they've figured out a way, or they've evolved a way, yeah. with their shell to create this kind of buoyancy, so they're not expending as much energy when they're just in water. 
Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if you've ever gone scuba diving, you know, Mm -hmm. buoyancy is one of the hardest things to learn, Mm -hmm. especially if you're in cold water and you need a thick wetsuit and the wetsuit is buoyant. So you need to add more weight. It's just Mm -hmm. like such a game. And and so this is where the chambers come into play because of how much the gas, how many chambers do they have or is it different? And is it add chambers as they grow? Okay. Um, so that's how the animal grows is that it, it outgrows its old chamber. And then just while it's doing that, it's building its new chamber. So they're always, most of their body is always in the outer chamber, the living chamber of the shell. Mm-hmm. And then they have these sealed off smaller chambers behind that. Mm-hmm. And the, and so the, the number of chair chambers just varies depending on the age of the animal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and each chamber usually has some amount of liquid in it and some amount of air in it. And they can't, um, um, they can't control it really fast. As mm-hmm. far as we know, it's not something the Nautiluses can do. So it's not like, um, oh, I want to go up 10 meters. Let me just pump a little gas into the shell. It's mm-hmm. it's more of uh, keeping it continuously neutral. And then if you suddenly want to go up a few meters, you, they would just use the jet propulsion to do that. Mm-hmm. So so that was the, my next question. I don't know if you're saying anything else about the shells, but no, I wanted to good. ask about the, the jet propulsion as well. All cephalopods have this? Uh, even the yeah. ones historically did it. When did this kind of come online or is this always As part of their anatomy or the best we can figure out is that it evolved kind of right along with that buoyant shell as a way to move around because the buoyant shell is what stopped them being snails basically Ah, before the shell was buoyant they would have been crawling on the Mm seafloor. And then once they were up in the water, jet propulsion evolved kind of right alongside that as a way to move. Mm -hmm. Could you kind of just explain, I mean, you're doing the book, but can you explain how the jet propulsion kind of works and how it's a feature for the the cephalopods and um, maybe what is, aside from the, the, uh, the connection with the shells, you know, what is the other uh, major feature for, for the propulsion um, for, for all of these cephalopods? Absolutely. I do want to say, I realized one more thing about the shells, which is that they weren't useless for protection. Mm-hmm. Like there's definitely a lot of evidence that uh, coiling them up, in fact, may have been in part a protective measure because a coiled shell is harder for a predator to grab and harder for a predator to break. It's more resistant to breaking pressure. Um, we have fossils that show that uh, depending on where a predator grabbed a cephalopod, it could actually escape and mend its shell in mm-hmm. some cases. So the, so the shell definitely also retained a protective function throughout their, their evolutionary history. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so and and then so the jet propulsion. So they would have been. Um, they would have this siphon, and they would be drawing water into the whole cavity of their body, kind of like taking a big deep breath. It's also how they were breathing. So so pulling in all that water, it would be washing over their lung, their gills, mm-hmm. which are like our lungs. Right, right, so they'd right. be pulling oxygen out of it, and then breathing out is the same thing as moving. So their breath and their movement are really intimately linked. And so when they take a big, deep breath in, that's the beginning of their movement cycle. And then they huff it all out through the siphon. Mm -hmm. And depending on how tightly closed that siphon is, the jet of water is organized differently. People study this in modern cephalopods and there's a lot of different interesting fluid dynamics to it. But the, the overall idea is that that jet of water going in one direction propels the animal in the other direction. And it's the same way that a jet engine works on an airplane. Mm -hmm. Um, Or if you were in, if you were in space with very little friction around you, you could do the same thing with breathing. Mm. If you, if you were just to breathe out a bunch of air in one direction, it would propel you in the opposite direction. Mm. Is this, I mean, underwater now with kind of just fast forwarding to current day, I mean, mm-hmm. they can move quite fast. I mean, yeah. very fast. I mean, that's, that's what's so, such the marvel of it is like, you don't see a lot of animals in such a, almost like a sprint where it just moves yeah. super fast. Is that something that it was always that way? Or, you know, as, is there differences between the kind of internalized shells they have now versus when they had externalized shells for the jet propulsion? How did it look different? Well, as it far seems as like one of the side effects or, or one of the maybe even driving factors of internalizing the shell and bringing it inside was really unlocking the full potential of jet propulsion. Mm-hmm. Because once the body, the mantle is free to fully expand, 
can, there's no shell constricting it, then that allows this, it's called hyperinflation that squid do, where they fill their body up super full and squirt it out. And that's how they do these really powerful escape jets to get away from predators super, super fast. And it's unlikely that any of the shelled cephalopods, any of the aminoids or nautiloids were ever able to go that fast Mm -hmm. because they always would have had the shape, the hard shell constricting how much Mm -hmm. they could inflate the mantle. Uh, so uh, I, for, I forgot to mention just uh, anything you want to say about the Vestermans uh, morpho space. Oh, right. Vestermans morpho space. So yeah. this was a really neat um, sort of visualization. It's it's a triangle shape um, showing how aminoid shells evolved over time. And they, because they tended to converge on these three different shapes, they would either be, uh, in fact, I'm going to pull it up to make sure that I get it right. Mm-hmm. Um, they would either be, um, sort of like very thin and coiled. Uh, it's called this oxycone shape. It's kind of like a discus. And so it's very hydrodynamic. And you can imagine that cutting through the water about as fast as any sort of externally shelled cephalopod could. Mm-hmm. And so the theory was that those those aminoids with that particular shell shape would have been fairly fast swimmers. And then the other two corners of the triangle, um, one of them are these serpenticones that are, they look like coiled up serpents, coiled up snakes. And in fact, it's those fossils that people used to find in England and call snake stones and sometimes even carve little snake heads onto them and come up with legends about how they were snakes that had been turned into stone. (laughs) And the serpenticones and then the other corner, which are these really wide shells that they're almost like spherical balls Mm -hmm. because they're so wide they're called sphericones um so the serpenticones and the sphericones would not have been able to cut through the water the way Mm -hmm. the oxycones would they would have been moving more slowly and the um let me make sure i get this right the probably were just kind of sieving through the water to collect whatever they could Mm -hmm. and the um, sphericones, those really round ones, the idea was that those might have been moving up and down in the water column, doing what's called vertical migration, mm-hmm. which is a pretty common habit for a number of species today, not just cephalopods, but a lot of different species in the ocean, where they'll come up t- towards the surface at night to eat while it's dark and it's harder for visually hunting predators to see them. And then when it's bright in the day, they'll hide down deep. Mm-hmm. And so it's this this could have been going on for a long time. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's so interesting how there's this like as as I'm just thinking back to like the Cambrian kind of uh, period, and then as they keep evolving over time, it gets more and more complex. Right. Um, both with their anatomy, but then also kind of their behaviors as well. So I guess kind of as slowly moving to, I guess you could I'm gonna say modern, but slowly what we understand is a kind of like first steps for how we understand the cephalopods today is the coleoids, right? And so they seem to be the precursor to modern cephalopods. Um, and they're that branch. So the, again, just the three, the aminoids who very expansive and then they, they don't, uh, they're not around anymore. And then you have the, the nautilus and then you have the, the coleoids. So tell us, um, It seems like the internalization of the shell was a key distinctive feature to separate them from the others, right? And um, so what can we make about why that happened? Was there an adaptive functioning from the Carboniferous period to the Cretaceous, or what's going on with the internalization of the shell? That's a really good question. I think there's still a lot of of uncertainty about Mm -hmm. how that transition happened and what the... uh, what the selective pressures were that were driving it, Um, but it's very likely related to vertebrates also diversifying during that time and cephalopods facing them as both predators and competitors. Mm. And so anything that made a cephalopod uh, a more streamlined, efficient swimmer um, or better able to escape predators was going to be, there's going to be a lot of selective pressure for that. And putting their shell inside their body helped with both of those things. It would have made them more streamlined swimmers, um, even though at first the shell would have still filled a lot of their body because at first the shell would have retained all those chambers and it would have been a fairly solid. I always want to call it heavy. I mean, it wouldn't have been heavy in the sense of making them sink because it was still, it still had gas inside, but just very substantial. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And so you wouldn't yet have anything like an octopus that could squeeze into hiding spaces. Mm -hmm. But what they could evolve as soon as their skin was on the outside was that amazing camouflage that they're known for today. Mm -hmm. And although we don't have fossils that can tell us when camouflage evolved, it does seem like there would have been a strong selective pressure for that as soon as it was possible because it would have been hiding them from their vertebrate predators and helping them to sneak up on their prey as well. Aside from the fish uh, or vertebrates being kind of coming onto the scene, uh, how much of the environment and the planet's changing environment? So, I mean, Carboniferous period is, I mean, a huge period for yeah. the environment, on, on, at least as it was kind of going to land and, and then all the way up to the Cretaceous. Um, so what, is there anything we can say about how that significantly impacted the, their evolution as well, or, or, or a lot of unknowns there? There's definitely a lot of unknowns, um, but I mean, I think that the one of the most, the single most uh, impactful environmental experience was the end Permian extinction mm-hmm. um, that you already referred to as the Great uh, Dying. The Great Dying, yeah, right. Right. I mean, it doesn't get as much press as the end Cretaceous extinction because it didn't mm-hmm. kill off the dinosaurs, but it did basically clear the world for the dinosaurs to evolve. I mean, you yeah. know about it already. It was yeah. just this yeah. absolutely mind boggling, you know, by some estimates, 90, 95% of species mm-hmm. went extinct. It was mm-hmm. just huge. And we think it was driven mostly by a lot of volcanic activity mm-hmm. during a fairly short period of time, meaning still probably thousands or even tens of thousands of years. But um, And so that actually killed off a lot of cephalopods. Um, but none of the those three groups went completely extinct. We still had nautiloids, coleoids, and aminoids that mm-hmm. survived through that, that end Permian mass extinction and were then able to really diversify to fill a lot of niches. And so in a way, it's kind of like the ancestors of dinosaurs that survived on land and then diversified to become the dinosaurs that we know of from all of the the research that has been done in the Mesozoic. And so in the Mesozoic, in the ocean, you get this huge flowering of aminoids. That's really when you get the peak diversity that I was talking mm-hmm. about of the big ones and the small ones and the coiled mm-hmm. ones and the uncoiled ones and the, the ones with crazy spines coming off of them and the ones <laughs> that uncoiled and then coiled themselves as knots and the ones that coiled like ice cream cones. And just like that is really where they shone. And a lot of it is, is likely because the oceans were kind of cleared out by this mass extinction. Mm. So, and with the coleoids, how do we understand them as separate from the other uh, cephalopods? Is this, they're the ones that have the ink, the suckers, the arm hooks. So just kind of tell us a little bit about them as being distinct from the aminoids and the nautilus. And then what were some of those evolutionary features for, you know, ink and suck? I mean, those are some pretty unique and distinct features um, and how those some of those continued to still continue on for uh, cephalopods today. Right, right. I kind of think of it as the coleoid package uh, because it's such a such a distinctive, as you say, suite of characteristics. You have um, you have an internal shell. You have uh, sort of bells and whistles on your arms, mm-hmm. whether it's suction cups or hooks. Uh, and you have this ink sac, and most likely you have camouflage and evolving along with all of those things is very likely a very complex nervous system, mm. brain and ganglia and neurons going right along with all of that to control it because it's a very, um, there's so many possibilities with a body like that when it becomes soft and flexible and can do so many different things that the nervous system is evolving right alongside it to create a diverse set of behaviors that can be done with it. Um, and that's really what we think. It's, it's almost like cephalopod evolution is so cool because the cephalopods that we know today octopuses and squid primarily that we, when we meet them, the suite of amazing characteristics they have are all coleoid specific. Mm -hmm. We Mm -hmm. hardly ever even think about a shell. It's their brains and their tentacles and their camouflage. And all of that stuff is like second, it's like cephalopods part two evolution. There was this whole amazing amount of cephalopod evolution that was all shell driven. Mm-hmm. And then coleoids internalized it and went this whole second route of incredible diversity. 
yeah, it's it's fascinating how each kind of major group from from common ancestors, these kind of three groups we've been saying, all have their kind of distinctive components to it. And in in modern times, all the way up till today, you know, col colioids have now really diversified in terms of again, cuttlefish, squid, octopus, etc. I, I guess I, a question I have about that is. Um, in terms of cuttlefish and the 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 poor lonely ram's horn squid, who's a, such a cool, um, I mean, just if you want to, I mean, say design, it's not obviously design, but the features of how it's shaped is is very distinct from any of the other ones. Um, why did they overhaul their kind of shell and their chamber s system? That you think so? This is getting a little bit more current uh, to 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 where we're at now in the ocean. But why why do you think that that is? There were a lot of interesting pressures going on there. Um, and it, I always want to look at kind of what else is changing in the ocean. So in the Mesozoic, we had these giant marine reptiles, mosasaurs and ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs that were driving um, a lot of the ecosystems by being the top predators. And then those went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. Um, and then what we see evolving in more recent times is a lot of marine mammals getting back mm. into the water, the early whales, early dolphins, um, and then eventually seal, sea lions, otters, all kinds of stuff. And a lot of those things became top predators in their parts of the ocean. Uh, and those animals um, started hunting by echolocation, mm. by sending out uh, vibrations, auditory vibrations, and hearing the sounds that bounce back. And so there's a, uh, a pretty compelling theory that at that point, it became really advantageous for cephalopod shells to shrink a lot more. Mm. The, the one, they were already internalized, but that fairly substantial internal shell that I was talking about would be sending back a really strong signal to any animal hunting by echolocation. And the smaller they got and the more reduced they got and the softer and more flexible their body got, the harder it would be for those echolocating predators to find them. Now, of course, dolphins and whales didn't stop evolving either. Mm -hmm. And so it became, you could think of it as kind of an arms race, the defense of the cephalopods and the offense of the, the cetaceans where now you have a sperm whale that can dive down to super deep dark water can't see anything but by clicking it can still find squid even though those squid have reduced their shells to almost nothing mm. just this thin little rod inside their body so it's it's, it's been an ongoing arms race it's, yeah it's it's uh, the thing that's coming out a lot is this idea that as there's more uh diversification of life in the oceans cephalopods find a way right they're finding a way to keep like it's like oh shit like there's all new new kids on the block that are bigger and badder we'll figure out another way i mean again this is happening over millions of years but it's one of those things where it's like okay we're you know the whole design of it so like again right if someone were to look at an octopus right now and then look at it, it's one of its common ancestors you know you don't have to go back 500 million years you can go back even 300 million years ago which just so categorically different Right. I mean, it just in, in terms of how they, they their features are and, and with some of their behavioral ecology, is, which is so fascinating how we can see um, really how how much uh, adaptation can really work with certain uh, certain animals. Absolutely. It's, it's definitely one of the most compelling things about cephalopods is that mm -hmm. they they seem to have a body plan, a set of genes, mm -hmm. a whatever it all is that is very flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and yeah. it can continually reinvent itself um and it's yeah. very cool yeah I, I, well on 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 the octopus is right is they have these kind of uh vestiges of you talking about in the book of the the pen i think mm -hmm. some of the users are talking about the the vampire feet and then the fins you just tell like what those vestiges are for them currently yeah the of, the of the vestiges of the shell specifically yeah 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 so the uh the the squid that I was talking about, that they have their internal shell doesn't have chambers anymore. Mm -hmm. It's completely reduced to just this very stiff rod. Mm -hmm. um, it's not it's not calcified. It doesn't have calcium the way a shell does, but it is stiff enough for their body to use it the same way that our body uses our 
our skeleton for our muscles to push against. Mm. Uh, mm. And so it gives the muscles of the squid's body some structure and something to push against. And it's actually why squid are the fastest living cephalopods. That pen actually gives them the, the uh, shape of their body and gives the muscles something to work against. Mm. And the, uh, and it also, they have two fins that, use it as kind of an attachment point so that it gives the muscles and the fins something to work against. Mm. And so all of the other cephalopods that we have today have different takes on the shell, the different mm -hmm. coleoids. So mm -hmm. that's squid. So in cuttlefish, they actually do still have chambers in their shell and it is mm. calcified. So the internal shell of a cuttlefish is called a cuttle bone. Um, and you can actually buy cuttle bones at a pet store because the calcium in them is good for birds. Mm. And so people will put cuttle wow. bones in their bird, their pet bird cage and the birds wow. will peck at them and get calcium that way. They're like little vitamin supplements. Wow. Um, and so that internal shell of a cuttlefish has chambers that has gas in it. So cuttlefish have that neutral buoyancy that I was talking about, mm -hmm. and they tend to not swim fast the way squid do. They're kind of just hanging out at a certain level and taking advantage of camouflage usually mm -hmm. to escape predators and to mm -hmm. find their prey. Mm -hmm. That's cuttlefish. And then octopuses, uh, some species have just a couple of little rods or a little horseshoe shape inside their body. And for them, that's also for their fins. So you don't mm -hmm. think of an octopus is having fins because the ones in aquariums don't. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of octopuses in the, the open ocean and in the deep sea that have two little fins and they look a little bit like ears. And so those octopuses tend to have these little attachment internal structures that the fin, the muscles of the fins can work against. And it's really only the near shore octopuses like the giant Pacific octopus that you'd see that I saw at an aquarium, uh, the little ones that are you find in tide pools that have completely lost even that. And don't have any little horseshoe or any little rod or anything inside. It's just so fascinating how they'll, I mean, humans have, you know, vestiges too. All animals have it from a, a common, a, you know, previous ancestor. But it's interesting how they will, again, have this kind of flexibility for some of the things that they're mm -hmm. doing. Um, so I, I got to ask, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, what can you tell us about uh, the, the Nautilus? Um, I, again, we have, if we, again, just a reminder, you know, if you go all the way back to the Silurian and you have the Nautiloids, I mean, there is really not that much difference in the current Nautilus we'll find in the ocean uh, from you know, 400 million years ago. I mean, it's, it's, it's astounding. It's just, and I yeah. know it's a puzzle for, for, for scientists. So why, why I mean, how did it do that? I mean, how did it, <laughs> why, we were just talking about the aminoids that have all these different, you know, shell types and it's so, so diverse and they didn't, you know, make it to current day. And, but how is this Nautilus still, still kicking kind of so sort wild. of in the same format? It was, we're talking I mean, we're talking about like two, at least two mass extinctions. Yeah. Like, it's like, they just keep wild. pattering along. They yeah. do. How, what, what, can, what can you say about it? There's a couple of really key points, but they aren't answers. I think it's, okay. I think it's important to be like, we don't know. For one thing, we don't know how true it is that they are as unchanged as they seem. Mm -hmm. because okay. the evidence for that is mostly in the shell mm. and not in the soft parts. And mm. you do look at a modern Nautilus and say, gosh, it's soft parts are weird. It has all of those tentacles. They're sticky and they're like extensible and retractable. They're, um, their eyes seem primitive to us. Um, and in a sense, they are. They're just a little keyhole lens instead of this more sophisticated lens and cornea that the other cephalo that the coleoids have, but their ability to sense and respond to chemicals in the water is immense. Mm. And we don't even understand it yet wow. because that's not something that we're very good at studying. Mm -hmm. We're very visual creatures. And so we're very good at giving visual tests to other visual creatures. Mm -hmm. um, we don't even understand how much we as humans rely on our sense of smell because it hasn't been studied that well. And so I think, that's something that always comes into my mind when I think about a Nautilus or I look at one swimming around is that from a visual point of view, it looks, it looks like a living fossil. They're mm -hmm. just bad mm -hmm. at swimming. They like bump into things. <laughs> they're slow, they're clunky, but we don't even know what's going on in other sensory worlds for them. And that stuff may have evolved and changed a lot over the millions of years that they've been around. Like the early 
if we saw a living nautiloid from the time of the ammonoids, from even before that, it might have had only 10 arms. Like this, this profusion of tentacles might have happened fairly recently. Mm-hmm. Um, it might have had a totally different type of behavior. Um, we really don't know what they were doing and what they looked like. So that's one thing is that there are there's so much that we don't know besides the shell that we don't even know how much they've changed. And then the other thing that's interesting about nautiloids that's different from both coleoids and aminoids is that they have a much longer lifespan. Unlike the octopus and squid that live for a year or less for some of the small species, um, they are living for decades uh, and often not reproducing until they're a decade old or more. And then they, when they do reproduce, they have large eggs that take a long time to develop. And then when the baby nautilus hatches out, it's just like a little nautilus. Um, and it's fairly large compared to, I mean, the contrast for me is with the species that I studied in graduate school, the Humboldt squid is an adult they can be as big as as a human but the babies are itty bitty so the a humboldt squid can live for a year or two years max often less than that they'll start reproducing at a few months old and a single female can make half a million or more eggs wow so many eggs and the reason she makes so many is that most of them die because they they hatch in a week and the babies that come out are smaller than a grain of rice and most of them are going to get eaten (laughs) so it's just a completely different strategy from the nautilus and there's it's quite possible that there's something about that long-lived strategy with big eggs that develop slowly that has allowed the Nautilus to weather mass extinctions in a way that aminoids were clearly not able to at the end of the Cretaceous. Hmm. But then interestingly, it then makes them more vulnerable now because that's the kind of life strategy that Hmm. doesn't do well with overfishing, with Mm -hmm. Mm overharvesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because the Nautilus is just, it's literally marching to the beat of its own drums. Like I'm going to do it on my time. (laughs) don't care what's going on around me in the on the planet on the oceans and you know it's still around and so it's it's it, it the, the the mystery uh and all the unknowns is kind of what makes it cool but it, it does kind of look like this is like a time capsule like this thing is just like kind of floating around in the ocean since you know hundreds of millions of years ago it's it's, it's a fascinating fascinating creature yeah. um and so I, I guess the the question is two questions kind of getting there i've kind of asked this in different different points but you know what was the the impact of the environment in the uh, cenozoic period right so this is kind of moving closer and closer now to modern day um on the evolution of cephalopods right is it, again is it the changing temperature in the planet um in the oceans and or or how much of you, know, you kind of mentioned earlier you know different whales so you know mm-hmm. uh, the the baleen and the toothed whales and all the differences that they started coming on these massive creatures uh, or other animals that were co-evolving you know how did the cephalopods co-evolve with them in the cenozoic period well, there's some evidence that Uh, cephalopods and a number of fish did this interesting movement from more deep water, open water towards near shore environments as Mm -hmm. coral reefs proliferated Mm -hmm. as um, kelp driven ecosystems. Like here where I live in California off the coast of North America and then South America, we have big kelp forests. Mm -hmm. And as those ecosystems and rocky reefs proliferated, um, both fish and cephalopods diversified into those niches and became these interesting near shore animals that would that would swim around rocks, hide under rocks, lay their eggs on kelp or on on coral and and kind of explore those environments as they became more um, more abundant due to Mm -hmm. changing changing current patterns and upwelling and things like that. Hmm. Um, so in terms of the current day and the Anthropocene, um, what can we say, I guess, about where cephalopods are today? I mean, we mentioned it kind of at the beginning, but there's a big diversity of cephalopods. Um, how many do we know of and how many are, or are we still finding out currently uh, in our current uh, age? Yeah, if if I remember right, I think the current species count is somewhere around 700 or 800 species. Wow. Um, 
And definitely new ones have been discovered probably at least every year. And just thinking about the last year, there's some, uh, there's a deep sea octopus called the ghost octopus. Um, it was discovered, uh, an octopus adorabilis as well was another recent species. Mm. And, uh, and so there, there, in one sense, there's a lot of them, hundreds of species. Um, but it's also, it's a lot fewer than all of the fish out there, for example, or, or all of the insects or anything. So, so it is a, a really distinctive group. Uh, and for how few species they are, they are incredibly abundant. Mm -hmm. A lot of species of squid in particular are hugely abundant. Um, and even and species that we don't necessarily think about very much are supporting other species that we do. Like I mentioned, the sperm whales hunting squid. Squid is almost all that sperm whales eat, mm -hmm. and they have to eat hundreds and hundreds of squid. Um, and so, a, in a week or even in a day, I think the calculations are. And so, mm -hmm. if you do a calculation of how many squid have to be in the ocean to support the predators that we know are eating them, it's kind of mind boggling. <laughs> And then, of course, there's also all the squid that people are eating because mm -hmm. uh, catching and fishing squid and octopuses has been something that people have been doing ever since we lived near the ocean. And a lot of those fisheries are growing as other fisheries become less available, as people have overfished other species. They've turned to squid and octopuses more and more. And so those... Um, some of those fisheries are considered fairly sustainable because they're species that have this massive turnover, the short lifespan and lots of babies. That tends to be a more sustainable fishery than something like a nautilus that has a long lifespan and not very many babies. Mm -hmm. And so although the number of species is small compared to some other groups, the actual number of individuals is quite astonishingly large. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask about that. I mean, do you have a strong opinion about those, about, you know, catching them and consuming them and, and any ethics around that? I mean, it's a big question, but, you know, just, your, just your, your very, you know, brief answer or, or, or you know, kind of reaction to uh, thoughts about people that, you know, eat them or, or how we continue to catch them. It is, it's a complex question because I, I personally am a vegetarian and have never eaten cephalopods or any other animal, um, but I've also met and worked with a lot of uh, fishing people, fishers in different countries and different places. And, and I think that there's, there's a lot to be said for fishing um, as a way of life that's really important to a lot of people sure. and, and subsistence and feeding the world. Um, I I definitely have concerns about octopus aquaculture specifically. There are people mm -hmm. working on trying to keep them in captivity to raise them for food, saying, like, okay, well, that's better than fishing them out of the wild. And I, I understand where that's coming from, but octopuses are predators, which means mm -hmm. that if you are raising them in captivity, you have to be feeding them other animals. Mm -hmm. And in general, that is not no. sustainable because if you're feeding them fish, well, that's fish that people could be eating. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think that in terms of sustainability and ethically feeding the growing population, going more towards kelp-based aquaculture and, and plant-based um, stuff as much as possible tends to be a more uh, sustainable route for sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you. I have two final questions here. Uh, again, just briefly, um, what do you make of some of the more uh, popularity with octopuses, cognitive abilities, their intelligence, maybe consciousness, socialization? And, you know, again, that's a, we could spend another, you know, an hour and a half, two hours Easily. on that stuff. But, <laughs> but uh, just kind of what are your kind of fresh thoughts on some of that stuff? Um. I think it's so cool. I mean, honestly, it's it's what captured me first about them was was seeing an animal that seemed to be looking back at me. And then as soon as I started reading about them and mm -hmm. reading that everybody feels that way pretty much. <laughs> uh, and, right. and it's led to all these studies of, of what is intelligence and what is consciousness. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that's really one of the most interesting things about sharing our planet with cephalopods yeah. is that they really stretch us to imagine what it's like to be something very different that still makes observations and integrates experiences and makes decisions and has memory because the, and plays, I mean, these are things that have been studied and identified has personality. And yet they're so, you know, they're the last time we had a common ancestor with them was so long ago. Yeah. So what does that mean? I mean, I think that it really makes us stretch our definitions. And also I think, in in an ideal world it it enhances our sense of kinship with mm -hmm. with the rest of the world 
Yeah, I, I agree. And the last question I'll, I'll ask is, you know, kind of a future oriented one. So, you know, what do you, they've been on the planet, cephalopods have been on the planet for a long, long, long time. Um, and what do you su- suspect is their future, especially considering many of the na- negative effects of climate change? Um, you know, obviously bleaching of the coral reefs, acidification of the ocean, many other factors. Where do you, they, they've been, they've been going at it on the planet for a long time, surviving many different types of extinction. And so what do you think is kind of the future for them as much as you can look into your crystal ball and and see what what it is for them? It's hard to say, right? But they they do seem as an overall group to be very resilient. Um, And we've already talked about the the ways that they survive previous mass extinctions. Um, They're there has been evidence that a number of species have actually been growing in abundance over the time that humans have been measuring such things. So really less than a hundred years, there's been an increase in abundance in a number of cephalopod species. Um, And the reason is likely because of the impacts humans have had on their competitors and predators. So I talked about fish and whales and dolphins and all of those things that love to eat cephalopods. Well, humans have really reduced the numbers of a lot of those things. And in many cases, it seems like cephalopods have benefited from that and Mm -hmm. been able to take advantage. Um, They also are very flexible with changing climate. And a lot of species, including the Humboldt squid that I studied, have a really flexible life cycle where depending on the temperatures and the nutritional Mm -hmm. conditions around them, they can grow slower or faster. They Mm -hmm. can mature at a much smaller size and just turn over the generations that much more quickly if it seems advantageous. Advantageous, and so they, um, you know, I definitely don't want to imply that they're they're not at the level of making conscious decisions based on their environment. It's all just sort of plasticity baked into their physical structures, the way their bodies develop, and the way that they interact with the world. And so, I um, I certainly expect them to be around for a long time, and uh, would love to come back in a time capsule in, in a <laughs> yeah. few million years and yeah. see what they made of themselves. It would be crazy to see what how they've continued to evolve their anatomy yeah. and shape and all that. Would be very fascinating. So. Well, look, uh, this was too much fun. I, I, I greatly enjoyed the conversation. Uh, your, your book is called Monarchs of the Sea, the extraordinary 500 million year history of cephalopods, which everyone should go and buy. Uh, where Thank can you. people find your work and find you online and all that good stuff? Sure. Yeah. So the, the book Monarchs of the Sea is should be available wherever fine books are sold at your favorite local bookseller or on the, the Internet. And um, I have a website. That's just my name, danastoff.com. And I'm on Twitter at Dana Stoff and Instagram, Dana Joy Stoff. I have a pretty distinctive name, so you can just find me by Googling me. Mm-hmm. Well, well, look, I mean, Dan, I mean, really, you were an absolute uh, treat. I, I just absolutely love talking about this stuff. You're super brilliant, uh, really love your passion. And it really was just a, a big privilege to, to talk to you. So I, I, I just can't say thanks enough for giving me your time and your, your energy energy and your passion. It was, it was so, so marvelous. It was loads of fun for me too. You're a really fun interviewer and ask some great questions. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. All right.